Court, Love, Uncourt by New Amsterdam. Chapter 5 Kaminari is leaning towards the mirror, eyeliner in hand, when the door slams open. He startles, hand jostling as he draws a crooked line from the corner of his eye to his ear. What the hell? No one really listens to his exclamation. Ashido, who'd been the one to throw the door open, strides right past him to Kirishima, stopping in front of him and resting her hands on his hips. You have to do something about Bakugo, she says. It should be hard for her to appear intimidating. She's already dressed for the show in a cheetah print dress and fishnets, her pink hair a cotton candy cloud around her face. But Ashido still manages to look murderous, her eyebrows slanting dangerously, emphasized by the heavy eye makeup she's wearing. Kirishima had been hunched over his own vanity, eschewing makeup in favor of scribbling notes on a pad of paper. Now, he very carefully sets down both pad and paper aside as he looks up. We gave him his own room to wait in, didn't we? Yes, Ashido confirms, arms shifting to cross over a chest, but Jido and I can still hear him screaming down the hall. Kirishima vaguely wonders what Bakugo could be screaming about. When Sarah had arranged for him to attend tonight's concert, Kirishima hadn't heard anything about pushback from the star himself. And it had been reported to Kirishima that Bakugo-san had arrived on schedule just half an hour ago. Kirishima had planned to say hi before they were due on stage. Did anyone ask what's wrong? Oh, no, Ashido says, still glaring at Kirishima. That's your job. He's your boyfriend. Fake boyfriend? Kaminari supplies helpfully, as he rubs at the side of his face with makeup remover. Whatever, Ashido snaps. Just stop him from yelling. You know how Jiro gets. She's got headphones in and is trying to drown out the noise, but if she's off today, it's your fault. Kirishima winces. Jiro likes to fully immerse herself in music before a show, and the three of them have long since learned to leave her alone during that time. He sighs and pushes himself to his feet. Okay, okay. I'll take care of it. This guy's really a piece of work, isn't he? Kaminari says, frowning. It's fine, Hiroshima says, adamantly. He doesn't know why he feels the sudden urge to defend Bakugo. He is a piece of work, and pretending to date him has caused Hiroshima no shortage of headaches. And yet, I'll take care of it, he repeats. He hears Bakugo before he sees him even though the door to the backstage waiting room is shut. I don't care, Bakugo screeches. I'm not doing it. You can't fucking make me. Without context, it sounds like a child's tantrum. Kirishima wonders if it can really be that simple. He takes a deep breath, knocks on the door, and then goes in without waiting for a response. Bakugo is standing up in the middle of the room, hands clenched at his side as he looms over the other person in the room. Sarah sitting in a comfortable armchair with his legs drawn up, not even looking as Bakugo berates him. I don't know what you want from me, then, Sarah says patiently. It's a good contract, and top billing. I told you, Bakugo seethed. I'm not working with Ponytail again, not after what she fucking did. I still think that's mostly in your head, Sarah shrugs. And besides, do you have any idea how long your blacklist is? If you actually never worked with any of these people again, you'd be stuck doing one-man shows. Maybe I'll just fire your useless ass. Hey, hey, Kirishima says, stepping further into the room when it becomes clear that neither of them will notice him otherwise. What's the problem? Bakugo spins around so quickly that it gives Kirishima whiplash. His cheeks are bright red, eyes shining with anger. And yet, it's unfair how good he looks in that moment. He's wearing crop pants and a pair of leather loafers, a v-neck and a burgundy-coloured baseball jacket. His blonde hair is brushed back from his face, and when his gaze lands on Kirishima for a moment, his expression changes. His mouth drops from his snarl for just a moment, before he recovers himself and throws his hands in the air. What the hell do you want? Bakugo demands. A little peace and quiet before my band goes on would be great, Kirishima says, honestly. You're causing a bit of a scene. Bakugo's face contorts, and then he turns bodily away from Kirishima. He crosses his arms over his chest and mutters something that Kirishima can't make out. Look, Sarah says, it's just one option. 
There was the other one, too. No. Bakugo's answer is explosive, even though his voice goes quiet as he utters the single word. Oh, come on, Sarah says. He turns to Kirishima. He's got an offer to go in and read for this awesome movie. Huge budget, the whole thing. And he won't even look at the script. Shut up. Bakugo snaps at him. I just don't get it, Sarah says, honestly. I know you and Midori have issues, but you've worked together before. For years. Why can't you do one movie together? Because I don't fucking want to, Bakugo says, voice rising again. Sensing that Bakugo may be about to explode once more, Kirishima wraps his knuckles against the back of Sarah's head. Hey, could you give us a second, maybe? Sarah lifts his brows, as though to say, You sure you want to be alone with this? Kirishima rolls his eyes. Just go get some of the snacks they keep for us backstage or something. Come back in ten. Sarah gets to his feet, stretching his long arms over his head. Good luck, he says, and then he leaves the room before Bakugo can start screaming at him again. Bakugo is standing in the middle of the room, petulant. It's a nice room, meant for VIP guests. A plush couch is pushed up against one wall, and Kirishima walks over to sit himself down on it. Wanna come sit with me? he asks. No, Bakugo spits. Okay, Kirishima says, agreeably. I'm gonna sit, though. I don't fucking care. For a moment, Kirishima lets the silence hang in the air. He imagines that he can hear Bakugo's heavy breathing. He works himself up with his entire body when he's angry. So much so that Kirishima wonders how he has the energy. Being upset takes a lot of effort, and Bakugo always seems to be upset. So, Kirishima says, leaning back against the couch. What's the deal with you and Midoriya Izuku? Bakugo lets out an impatient tut. There's no deal, he says viciously. I'm never working with him. Ever. Okay, Kirishima agrees. Why? I mean, you were on UA together for five years, and I know your characters hated each other on the show, but by the end you got along really well. And all the reviews said the development of Daiki and Nobuhiko relationship is one of the best and most complex on the show. Kirishima cuts him off when he sees how fierce Bakugo's glare has gotten. I'm just saying, he finishes off, somewhat lamely. You must have gotten along, having gone through all of that. It's called fucking acting, Bakugo snarls. It's all fake, and I just happen to be really goddamn good at it. Okay, Kirishima says again. So, what's the actual problem? What are you, my fucking therapist? Kirishima shrugs. No, I'm your boyfriend. Bakugo makes a noise like a boiling kettle. Like hell you are. Kirishima lets out a long breath. You know that, and I know that. But we don't want anyone else to know that, do we? And when we're at a movie premiere, and you sneak off to scream at some other guy, that's pretty weird. I wasn't sneaking off with him, you stupid fucking... Okay, okay, Kirishima says, lifting his hands in a gesture of surrender. But you know, it'd be great if you keep me in the loop, at least. For a moment, he thinks that Bakugo is going to brush him off, again. But then Bakugo's shoulders lower from when they've hiked up to his ears, and he deflates, just a little. Passing his lips, he walks over to sit on the couch, on the opposite end from Kirishima. I don't want to do another fucking project with him, he says finally, and I told Soy Sauce what I wanted, and if he can't get me that, then I don't know why I keep him around. He's doing his best, Kirishima says, feeling that he should stand up for Sarah's honor. I mean, if you're getting offers, that's good, right? Weren't you worried that when you came out, it'd be a scandal? Bakugo huffs out another breath. I don't give a shit about any of that, coming out or whatever. Oh, Kirishima says. He supposed Sarah had mentioned that, saying it was Bakugo's PR team that was scrambling, more than Bakugo himself. Me too. I mean, most people I know figured it out pretty easily. It was different for Judo. She was at this big conservatory when she was younger, and everyone thought she was going to end up first chair in the symphony, 
or something. She doesn't hide the fact that she likes girls now, but... Hiroshima stops when he sees Bakugo looking at him flatly. I don't care, Bakugo says. At that, Kirishima cracks a smile. No, I guess you wouldn't. Bakugo glares at him, eyeing him sideways from the other end of the couch. For a moment, there's silence between them. Hiroshima glances up at the wall clock, calculating how much time he has. He's already dressed for the concert. Low-necked black tank, comfortable dark jeans, and his hair is spiked up. A thick red leather bracelet is fastened over his left wrist, a gift courtesy of Kaminari. It's a simple enough ensemble. It's a simple enough ensemble. But that's what he needs with all the energy he expends on stage. Bakugo mutters something, too low to be intelligible. Huh? Kirishima turns back to him. I said, are you just going to sit there? Why the hell are you even here? Hiroshima blinks. Oh, well, you're my guest. And you're upset. It's basically my responsibility to make sure you're having a good time, right? No, Bakugo says, immediately. This is fucking fake, Hiroshima. Why would you care if I'm... Ugh. He says it like it's the most unbelievable thought. That Hiroshima wouldn't want him to be miserable. Hiroshima wonders, for a moment, if Bakugo could possibly be unaware of how attractive he is. Not in just an aesthetic sense, either, but in the way he pulls other people towards him. Surely he realizes how much Hiroshima is drawn to him. Even when Bakugo is screaming or ranting, Hiroshima is curious. He doesn't get how someone could be so wrapped up in their own emotions to completely block out everyone else's. I told you, Hiroshima says. I want you out in that audience tonight, and I want to know you're there, so I can perform for you. I know that when you see me, I'll be the absolute best I can be. Anything else would be, I don't know, disgraceful to my honor as a man. Bakugo deliberately draws his eyes from Kirishima's head to his toes. What man? He asks snidely. Now Kirishima pouts, puffing out his chest. I'll have you know that I am the manliest member of this band. Well, aside from Ashido, maybe. Bakugo's brows crinkle as he tries to make sense of that statement. Then he huffs out something that Kirishima is beginning to recognize as a laugh. You're such a fucking idiot, he says. But there's no venom in his words. If Kirishima didn't know any better, he'd say that Bakugo was looking at him almost fondly. That idea makes his heart flip over in his chest. It's a stupid, impossible thought. But what if Bakugo really did like him? What if he wanted to spend time with Kirishima, too? Even just as friends? What if there was anything between them that wasn't just a contrivance? I want you to watch me, tonight. Kirishima blurts out, suddenly. I'll, I'll prove it to you. We're great. Our music is amazing. And if you watch me, you'll see. I know you will. Bakugo leans away from Kirishima, brows drawing together again. What the fuck are you talking about? He mutters. The whole point of coming was to watch you, wasn't it? He says the words petulantly, arms crossed over his chest. And of course, he's right. That was the entire point. Of course, if Bakugo is here, he's already agreed to do that much. Kirishima looks away, embarrassed. He'd gotten too excited let his emotions run away from him. He gets to his feet, awkwardly clearing his throat. Anyways, he says, have you calmed down now? Bakugo looks like he's about to take issue with that question, but then he just rolls his eyes and sinks back further into the couch. Whatever. Okay, Kirishima says, not trusting himself to look over at Bakugo. I've got to go, sound check, but... Try to have fun tonight, okay? In the abstract, Kirishima knew that having his name and picture plastered all over the tabloids was going to change his life. He knew that being tied to Bakugo Kartsky would bring him more fame and attention than he'd ever had before in his life. But, for some reason, he hadn't been prepared for this. The venue where present Mike had been in residency for the past few weeks is a massive stadium repurposed from an Olympic judo arena. 
Hiroshima has never looked up the exact number of seats. The idea of it is too overwhelming. But he knows that present Mike sells such shows wherever he goes. He also knows that, as the opening act, Riot is there to pad out the timing. The audience filters in during their shows, and although they always play to a crowd, it's not the packed seat-by-seat -seat extreme of what present Mike draws later in the same night. Usually, when Riot takes the stage, Kirishima can pick out the empty seats throughout the venue. Tonight, he looks out and sees a sea of faces, people dressed in red, purple, pink, and yellow, and he hears an ear-splitting uproar as the stage lights go on in a dim amber, so that the silhouettes of the band members are visible. Riot! 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 He's used to enthusiasm, to applause and cheers, but this... This is specifically for them. A purple light goes on over Juro, standing poised with her guitar. As soon as the light hits her, her fingers begin to dance across the strings, starting up a melody. Next, a yellow light flashes over Kaminari. His drum beat starts out steadily, filling out the foundation for Juro's notes. The red light is next, over Kirishima. He knows his role by root lets his fingers start moving before he even thinks about it, guided by Kaminari's steady rhythm. Kirishima! The entire crowd seems to scream in unison, the noise breaking Kirishima's concentration like a chord that's just been yanked out of an amp. He glances up, surprised, even as he forces himself to keep playing. Some more unaffected part of his brain takes over the music, muscle memory helping it along. But Kirishima is still looking out over the crowd, lips slightly parted, as he takes in the hundreds of people shouting his name. In front of him, on stage, a pink light shines on over Ashido. She grips her microphone in both hands, and without any preamble, she begins to sing. Her voice soothes the crowd, focusing their energy so that all eyes are drawn to her. Her voice isn't perfectly smooth or melodious, there's an edge to it that comes out at the high moments of the song, a bit of personality and emotion that breaks the flow in a way that keeps everyone's attention. It's then that Kirishima remembers the last time he felt quite like this. It had been years ago, the last time he'd played at this venue before Riot had accepted the gig with present Mike. He hadn't been much of anyone back then, just a stupid kid with lank black hair, a love of music, and a heart too weak to fulfill his own ambitions. Ashido had been singing on that night too. Still a teenager, wearing angelic white and made up with rosy cheeks and pink lips. Her voice had also drawn the crowd's attention, but the music hadn't been Riot's high-charged erratic rock. And Kirishima, playing behind her with the rest of the band, hadn't been given his own spotlight. No one in the crowd had known his name. But now, everything is different. He's only slightly behind Ashido, and the crowd is yelling his name and singing along to lyrics he wrote. Kirishima breaks out into a smile as he strums his guitar, the song building to a furious crescendo. And then, Kaminari stops playing, and Jiro pauses her skilled dance over the strings of her guitar. Kirishima picks up the melody and Ashido sings over the simple line of music. It's a song about joy, about the manic energy of youth, of singular moments to live in that get remembered like the negatives of photographs, never quite clear, though they leave an impression all the same. This is what he loves, these moments when he can feel the energy flowing through him channeled by his bandmates, when they act as a unit in perfect sync, they sing Kirishima's lyrics and play Jiro's melodies and follow Kaminari's beat, and Ashido ties them all together. As the song comes to a close, the crowd bursts into furious applause. Kirishima leans back on his heels, winded. It's Ashido who leans forward, waving out to the crowd enthusiastically. We're riot, she says with a wink, gesturing at the rest of them. Welcome to the show. They've played this set enough times now that it should be routine. But the energy of playing to a full crowd 
of hearing his own name on their lips changes the atmosphere for Kirishima entirely. He's hyper-aware throughout this performance, his heart stuttering in his chest whenever he takes conscious note of the amount of people he's playing to. And there's the small fact that this isn't the same set they always play. At Kirishima's suggestion, they've changed up their finale, but now that the moment to implement that change is drawing closer, he's suddenly more nervous than he can remember being. It's towards the end of the show that Ashido turns to Kirishima in the middle of the song, crooking her finger and gesturing for him to step up towards her. Kirishima has no idea why she does that. She never has before, on stage. But his body reacts before his mind can catch up. He steps towards her, the stage crew following his movements with the spotlights until red and pink are intermingled on stage. The crowd explodes. Ashido pulls her microphone off its stand, holding it in one hand as she sings, using her other hand to pull through Kirishima's spiked hair. He's used to her touching him. The four of them have all grown used to being cuddly, given how much time they spend together. But this is a more deliberate move. She circles around him, hips swaying in time to the music, words washing over him as though she's whispering them in his ear. It takes longer than it should for Kirishima to realize what she's done. By the time she's finished moving, they've completely reversed positions. Now, Kirishima stands at the center of the stage, tethered only by his amp cords, and Ashido has become a moving target, slightly left of the center. She's given Kirishima the spotlight. The song comes to a close, and again the crowd erupts into applause. Kirishima stands on stage, looking out over the faces and raised hands. Are there more people in the crowd now than were there only a few songs ago? Beside him, Ashido nudges Kirishima with her hip. He startles, realizing he's meant to start the next, last song. But instead, he keeps staring out at the crowd. Kirishima has never lacked for dreams. And since he began scribbling down lyrics and tapping out beats, he's wanted to be a performer. He wants to bring people joy through his music, to connect to them in the way he's connected to Crimson Chevalier's music since he was a child. But this, this is... He doesn't know where to look. He doesn't know who to focus on. He doesn't know how he's supposed to reach any of these people when his mouth is too dry for him to speak. When his fingers feel numb, frozen over the strings of his cherry red guitar. And then he glances up. The VIP boxes are above the general seating, close enough to the stage to give those important people the best views without requiring them to mix in with the masses. Kirishima has never had anyone to offer those prized seats to before now. In the closest box, he can make out two figures among the rest. The first is a man in his forties, with long, dark hair. There's a grey scarf wound around his neck, hiding half of his face. He slouches back in his seat, eyes sleepy. But Kirishima's gaze doesn't rest on that man, even though he registers as vaguely familiar. Instead, Kirishima glances over to the person next to him. Bakugo is sitting up in his stadium seat, leaning forward. He has his chin rested against one hand, eyes narrowing with anger. No, not anger. Focus. He's looking right at Kirishima, just like he'd been asked. He's not looking at anyone else. Under the flashing lights, his eyes stand out stark red, and Kirishima is drawn in by them. Kirishima coughs, clears his throat. The moment seems to be dragging on forever but the awkwardness hasn't registered with the crowd yet. Ashido slings an arm over his shoulders, her laughter echoing through her mic and over the crowd. She's not laughing at him, but instead trying to calm him down. Is there something you wanted to say? She asks, playing coy for the audience's benefit. Yeah, Kirishima breathes out, eyes still pulled towards Bakugo. His voice crackles over the mic, and heat floods his face. But then he clears his throat, and says softly, 
This is for you. He doesn't specify who he's talking to, but a hush falls over the crowd as though hundreds of people have simultaneously drawn the same breath. In that moment of stillness, Kirishima begins to play. He loves music, but he can't write an entire song on his own. He comes up with the lyrics, snatches of rhyme patterns and general beats that sound good enough in his head. Then he'll bring what he's come up with to Juro, and she'll refine his ideas and add the melodies, make the music more complex and beautiful than Kirishima could have managed on his own. Kaminari lays the beat in, grounding Juro's ambitious notes, and then Ashido will lay her voice on top, and while they're rehearsing and writing, she and Kirishima will sing together, filling the gaps for each other and building on everyone's ideas. So now, standing in the center of the stage, Kirishima plays a song that doesn't belong just to him. His hand trails up and down the neck of his guitar, like an athlete running staircases, barely pausing for breath. The song spreads out over the crowd, not the erratic energy of the last number, but something calmer and more deliberate. Despite that, Kirishima feels the intensity of this song more than any other. He's only playing alone for an instant, but it drags out in his mind for an age before Jiro and Kaminari begin to play around him. And then Ashido steps up again, lifts her mic, and sings. Despite the fact that it took four people to write this song, it conveys a simple and direct message. It's a song about meeting someone and wanting to fall in love with them. About the moment of certainty, looking at their face and knowing that if you step forward even a little bit, you'll fall into a deep well of emotion just waiting to be discovered. And as he plays his song and listens to Ashido singing his lyrics, Kirishima keeps his gaze on Bakugo. By the time they get off stage, Kirishima is drenched with sweat and coming down off an adrenaline high. His entire face is heated, cheeks red and hair matted with sweat. The echoing cheers of the crowd follow Riot as they leave the stage and head to one of the lounges backstage. The four of them throw themselves into a room, letting out a collective sigh of relief. Kaminari lays flat on the couch, reaching up to unbuckle his black choker and massage his neck. Jiro slumps down beside him, resting her head against Kaminari's shoulder without caring about how the colourful triangles she's painted on her cheeks have smudged. Ashido foregrows furniture entirely and lays out on the floor, limbs splayed like those of a starfish. Her hair puffs around her face, and she reaches up to yank off her yellow headband and press at her temples. Kirishima stands frozen in the doorway, for a moment, the screams of the crowd still ringing in his ears, and the image of Bakugo's blazing stare burned into his memory. None of them move or speak. They don't have to. Each of them recognized how different the energy had been tonight. Couldn't help but notice the surge of the crowd, or the way more people had known the lyrics to sing along. Eventually, Kirishima slumps down against the wall, and the four of them turn their heads to look at each other. It's Kaminari who laughs first, followed by Ashido, and then Kirishima. Jiro joins in last the infectious energy of her band catching like a spark on dry brush. Their happiness burns through them like a wildfire, and for a moment, they don't have to think about anything else. What are you still doing here? A voice snaps at them sometime later. Kirishima glances up to see present Mike, or Yamada Hizashi, as he's known off stage. His blonde hair is quiffed to perfection, even after the two hours he spent on stage, though he shed his leather jacket to reveal the tight t-shirt he wears underneath. Kirishima wonders, vaguely, if Yamada-san had thrown the jacket out into the crowd for some enthusiastic fan to catch. Huh? Kirishima glances up, tired now that the energy of the crowd isn't fueling him. Yamada claps his hands together, jolting the rest of them out from their stupor. There's a crowd outside, he says impatiently. They're waiting for you. It's Jiro who speaks up, glancing at Yamada skeptically. Are you sure? 
Of course I'm sure, Yamada grasses. Go, sign some posters so my fans can have their chance. Kirishima almost laughs at that. Yamada might be something of a prima donna, but Kirishima has seen him spend hours making his way through a signing line. He's never left a fan wanting. Achingly, Kirishima gets to his feet. Let's go. The crowd outside the stage door is much smaller than the one inside the stadium had been, but it seems larger. Without the buffer of the stage itself and the shield of his music around him, Kirishima is overwhelmed by the amount of people screaming as soon as the four of them step out of the door. One of the crowd managers hands out metallic permanent markers. Gold for Kaminari, pink for Ashido, purple for Jiro, and red for Kirishima. The crowd is a mix of all people, all ages and genders and styles of dress. Some of them have handmade posters, and many of them are holding a copy of Riot's single. All of them are making noise. Kirishima! One of them shrieks as he approaches. That's me, Kirishima says, because it's true. He lifts the marker to sign the man's CD, writing out all of the characters of his name, and then two interlocking English R's all written in red. Ashido, Jiro, and Kaminari make their way through the crowd around him, signing various things as they go. Ashido stops for selfies every few steps, putting up both of her hands in victory signs as she tries to balance her marker. Kaminari shoots a thumbs up at his fans and occasionally pulls in Ashido for a group picture. Jiro is more aloof, signing her name with quick efficiency and blushing whenever someone asks for a picture. Kirishima goes through the crowd, smiling as much as he has, thanking everyone who speaks to him. It's when he makes his way halfway through the line that he notices what his particular fan is holding out for him to sign. It's a magazine, open to a specific page. On that page is a picture of Kirishima, on the ground at the red carpet event, bracing himself for Vavaka Gokatsuki. Their eyes are locked, as though they don't even notice the picture is being taken. You want me to sign this? Kirishima squeaks. The young woman holding it up nods emphatically. If you don't mind, it's just I support you and Bakugo-san so much and I... Kirishima scribbles his name over the page without a second thought, before the heavy weight of guilt has time to settle over him. He hadn't even seen those pictures yet, hadn't bothered to go looking for them. But now that he cares to notice... He sees many people holding up similar magazines. They must have heard the interviews from the red carpet, seen that first picture from weeks ago. Maybe it was through Bakugo's fame and Kirishima's by association that they had come to be here. But they'd all been chanting Riot's name all night, dancing to their songs and singing along to Kirishima's lyrics. What does it matter how they got here, as long as they're enjoying themselves now? These thoughts swirl around Kirishima like a heavy fog as he continues stepping through the crowd. He's genuinely happy that these people are here, and their enthusiasm has reignited his energy. Even without the music connecting them, in this moment, he still feels immeasurably close to them. And beyond that, he's grateful that they've given him a chance. It's in that haze that Kirishima gradually makes his way to the back of the line, a low gate cuts the crowd off from where the members of Riot are walking, so that none of them can rush in too quickly. Kirishima barely registers getting to the end of the gate, until someone calls out to him. Hey, asshole. That's not the tone anyone else in the crowd had been using, to say nothing of the words themselves. Kirishima glances up, and there, at the end of the crowd, separated by the venue's security, is Bakugo. He pays no attention to the gate, hooking one leg over it and vaulting himself to the other side. As soon as the crowd realizes who he is, they begin screaming, and flashes of dozens of cell phone cameras appear like sunspots in Kirishima's vision. Bakugo doesn't seem to mind any of it. He stops towards Kirishima, his face etched into hard, intense lines. For a second, Kirishima wonders if he should be bracing himself for a punch. But then Bakugo is right there, beside him, reaching out 
and grabbing the low neck of Kirishima's tank to pull him forward. For a second, they stare at each other, Bakugo's eyes smoldering and Kirishima's widening. Then, Bakugo leans in and presses his lips against Kirishima's. The crowd grows impossibly louder, and from somewhere beside him, Kirishima hears Kaminari shriek, Bakugo! But then everything else fades out of focus. Instinctively, Kirishima lifts a hand to grip on Bakugo's upper arm, holding him close. He's the one who leans in the second time, and when Bakugo lifts his head in surprise, the kiss goes off center, so that Kirishima's lips are pressed to the corner of Bakugo's mouth. Something electric sparks through him, and Kirishima closes his eyes and breathes deep. He doesn't want this to end.